the intriguing world of finance and innovation with a story about one of the most powerful financial empires ever, the House of Morgan. How did they manage to get the world in their debt? Stick around to find out, and let's get started. Our story begins in the early 1900s with a genius inventor you might have heard of, Nikola Tesla. Tesla was known for his groundbreaking ideas and incredible inventions. By 1900, he had convinced the legendary financier J.P. Morgan to fund one of his most ambitious projects. Tesla believed he could create a transatlantic wireless communication system using his theories of earth and atmospheric electrical conduction. Imagine being able to send messages across the ocean without any wires. At that time, another inventor, Guglielmo Marconi, was making waves with his short-range radio wave-based wireless telegraph system. But Tesla was confident his idea would be far superior. He pitched his vision to Morgan, who, intrigued by the possibilities, decided to invest. Morgan handed Tesla a whopping $150,000. That amount is equivalent to over $5.4 million today. In exchange for this funding, Tesla offered Morgan a 51% control of the patents. It seemed like a win-win situation. But things took a twist almost immediately. As soon as the ink was dry on their agreement, Tesla had a bold idea. Why stop at communication? Why not use this technology for wireless power transmission as well? He believed he could create a system where electricity could be transmitted through the air to homes and businesses without the need for wires. Excited about this new vision, Tesla started scaling up his project. He planned to build an impressive facility at Wardenclyffe on Long Island. But here's where the story takes a turn. Tesla's grand vision required more money, and when he went back to Morgan for additional funds, Morgan refused. The financier wasn't convinced about the viability of wireless power and saw it as too risky an investment. Without Morgan's continued support, Tesla struggled to find other investors willing to back his groundbreaking but expensive project. As a result, the development of Wardenclyffe stalled. By 1906, the site was abandoned, and Tesla's dream of a world powered by wireless energy faded into obscurity. Now, you might wonder, why is this story so significant in the grand tale of the House of Morgan? It's a perfect example of how the Morgans were able to shape the future by deciding where to place their financial bets. While Morgan's refusal to further fund Tesla's project might seem like a missed opportunity for a world-changing innovation, it also highlights their cautious and calculated approach to investment. John Pierpont Morgan was born on April 17, 1837, and would go on to become one of the most influential financiers and investment bankers in American history, leading the banking firm that eventually became known as J.P. Morgan & Company. He played a pivotal role in corporate finance during a time when the American economy was rapidly transforming. Morgan was not just any banker. He was the driving force behind a wave of industrial consolidations that fundamentally changed the landscape of U.S. business. Morgan's influence can be seen in the creation of several major multinational corporations. He was instrumental in forming U.S. Steel, International Harvester, and General Electric, names that are still giants in their industries today. Through these vast holdings, Morgan wielded immense influence over capital markets in the United States. Biographer Adrian Wooldridge has described Morgan as America's greatest banker. Morgan's legacy is a complex one. He was a man of immense power and wealth, but also a visionary who helped shape the modern industrial economy. In March 1913, while traveling in Rome, Italy, Morgan passed away in his sleep at the age of 75. He left behind a massive fortune, estimated by biographer Ron Cherno to be around $80 million, which is equivalent to about $2.5 billion today. His son, John Pierpont Morgan Jr., inherited his business and continued his legacy. From an early age, Morgan preferred to be called Pierpont rather than John. 
he received his early education in a mix of public and private schools in New England. In 1856, Junius sent him to Bellarive, a prestigious school in the Swiss village of La Tour de Piles. There, Pierpont honed his French, gaining fluency in the language, which was a valuable skill for a future financier dealing with international business. This diverse and rigorous education set the stage for Pierpont Morgan's future success. Between April and July 1861, Morgan launched J. Pierpont Morgan & Company, operating out of a modest one-room office at 53 Exchange Place. Initially, most of his business mirrored what he had managed at Duncan Sherman, largely handling transactions for his father. During this period, the Morgans also increased their trade in European securities, benefiting from a large deposit by W.A.W. Corcoran, who liquidated his American holdings out of sympathy for the Confederacy. Morgan's adeptness at navigating the volatile gold market further boosted his profits. In October 1863, he and Edward B. Ketchum orchestrated a significant transfer of gold to England, causing a price spike. They sold their holdings at a high profit, although critics accused them of trying to corner the American gold market. Despite the controversy, the economic impact was relatively minor. J.S. Morgan transferred all remaining commercial credit and securities accounts from Duncan Sherman, solidifying J. Pierpont Morgan & Company as a formidable player on Wall Street by the end of 1862. To expand the business internationally, Junius Morgan hired Dabney, a well-respected senior partner from Duncan Sherman, known for his accounting prowess and integrity. Throughout the 1860s and into the 1870s, both Dabney Morgan and J.S. Morgan and Company focused on merchant banking and commodities. Between 1863 and 1873, the firm's securities profits only exceeded trade commissions in 1865. They traded globally in various commodities, including iron rails, American cotton, Philippine tobacco, Brazilian coffee, and Peruvian guano. On Levi P. Morton's advice, Morgan secured an exclusive four-year contract with the Peruvian government in 1865 to export guano, a key ingredient in fertilizer and gunpowder, earning a 2.5% commission. Thanks for watching. Please like the video, press the subscribe button, and also drop your thoughts in the comment section.